we'll get to the panel. Um, but uh, thank you for uh, for joining us for uh, 40 years of DSA um, in the future. Um, a COVID announcement. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that all socialism conference attendees are required to wear masks, fully covering the nose and mouth while indoors uh, in conference spaces, including hallways and meeting rooms. Speakers from the front of sessions may remove their masks in order to deliver their presentations, but only while actively speaking. And audience members are still required to wear masks even while asking questions or making comments. The mask policy is in place to protect all of us, especially if you know compromise on the risk of contracting COVID-19. So thank you for your compliance. I'll also say that um, there may be some Whisper or chatter in the room from from uh, people who are you know uh, having things translated for them, so it's okay if that happens. Um, so again, welcome uh, to 40 Years of DSA. Um, my name is Justin Charles. I use he/him pronouns. I'm a member of DSA's National Political Committee. Um, we're here to talk about you know. This year was the 40th anniversary of TSA's founding, uh, founded in 1982. Like me, I also turned 40 this year. Um, so, uh, DSA in 1982 uh, and DSA uh, in 2022, very different organizations. Uh, we have before us, as panelists, uh, people who can kind of speak to uh, the kind of broad uh, swath of experiences and, and the ways that DSA has looked in the past. Um, briefly, I'll introduce folks. Uh, we have Max Albaum. Uh, Max is on the editorial board of Convergence Magazine, formerly Organizing Upgrade. Uh, he's author of Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lennon, Mao, and Shea, uh, and a participant of the 1970s movement. Uh, we also have Jose La Luz, uh, uh, who is a, a current member of the National Political Committee of DSA uh, and also a founding member of DSA uh, as a member of uh, DSOC, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee. Uh, we have uh, David Duhalde, who has uh, been a longtime member of DSA as well. Um, from the YDSA days up through uh, today, also served on staff at DSA, uh, with a lot of experience there. We also have Natalie Mathiri, um, similar kind of uh, timelines as, as David DeHalde. Uh, Natalie has also served on the National Political Committee. I served alongside her last term. Um, so all of these folks are basically going to speak for 10 minutes about their kind of era of participation in DSA and the lessons that it, that it might hold for us in the present and in the future. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I'm going to let Max lead off, then we'll hear from Jose, then we'll hear from David, then we'll hear from Natalie, um, and a little bit of back and forth amongst the panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so yeah, I'll head it off to Max. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Did you want to get up or do you want to sit? Uh, whatever works for you. Uh, so, my charge when I was invited to speak was to talk about the Civil War of 1862 to 1863. In a 40 years of DSA panel. Uh, one component is celebratory. Uh, DSA today is a breath of fresh air for everybody on the left uh, and kudos to those people who kept it together through lean years and all the people who flooded into it and transformed it since 2017. Uh, and everyone on the left, whether they're members of DSA or not, and in the interest of full disclosure, I will disclose that I'm not a member of DSA. Everyone has a stake in the success of DSA. So that's the celebratory aspect. Uh, 
Uh, but it's also a time for self-reflection and for some really sober thinking about the challenges we're facing right now. Uh, DSA and the broader left uh, face immense challenges, and it's no secret that DSA itself uh, faces a lot of difficulties, and there is a lot of disagreement within DSA over what the direction of the organization should be, or even what questions need to be addressed first and foremost in order to determine the direction of the organization. Uh, so we're trying to balance uh, those tensions, and in my political experience, the best way to do that is for people to put their politics right out on the table, straightforwardly and as specifically as they can, uh, build on areas where we agree, and have a little political fight about the areas that we disagree, and figure out in a healthy way how to move on from there. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do in a brief time out of life. Uh, as Justin mentioned, DSA formed in 1982, but in many respects, DSA is a product of the 1960s upsurge, because the two groups that joined together to form DSA came out of the 1960s movements in different ways. The New American Movement was part of the revolutionary upsurge, the generation of 1968 that turned to revolutionary politics. Uh, DSOC had different origins, it originated in the late, late 60s, early 70s split from the Socialist Party, which at the time uh, was vacillating in its opposition to the Vietnam War. DSOC was finding a form to be the, the anti-war voice and to carry their own socialist politics into the anti-war uh, movement at the time. But the 1960s powers over it. DSA both at its formation and later in a deeper way than specifically the origins and the groups that formed it. Uh, the 1960s upsurge had two tremendous political breakthroughs. We broke the back of Jim Crow and we ensured the defeat of the United States in Vietnam. And these were body blows against the way the U.S. ruling class had dominated not only this country, but most of the globe for many, many decades. And it meant that the backlash against those two victories began within hours of each of those victories being won. And the fact of the matter is, we are still living through that backlash today. In fact, we are at the high point of that backlash. That has gone through a number of stages, and I'll try to talk about them later. Uh, but we're now at the point where the country faces two different roads. Now, the growth of socialism, the expansion of DSA, uh, the tremendous uh, gains that have been made in the sophistication as well as the size of the left in the last five years, that's very important. And it's a preoccupation, of course, for obvious reasons in those people who want to build DSA uh, in the next stage. But it's a mistake to put that as the center of our strategic thinking. Our strategic thinking has to be based upon where is the country right now? Where is the world? What is the breakthrough that's necessary in order to move forward? And how does the left fit into that? And the breakthrough that's necessary to move forward is to finally call a halt to the backlash that began in the mid and late 60s and has continued right up through, through several stages today. And we're at a point where the country faces two roads. One of those roads is to descend into a racist authoritarian regime that would be a hybrid of Jim Crow 2.0, white supremacy, Christian supremacy, homophobia, toxic brew, including climate change denialism, and let's make no mistake, political violence directed against all opponents of that regime. The other possibility is to break the back of the MAGA coalition that is uh, operating and is behind that authoritarian road, and to start a new progressive cycle, uh, a new progressive cycle toward a multiracial democracy and an economy that works for all, 
and those of us who were socialists within that broad coalition beginning to take the, the long march towards socialism. Uh, in my opinion, clarity that that is the central strategic question and debating our differences about that is the only thing that will equip us to deal with the challenges that we're going to face in the next few years. Because what we have to do, if that's correct, is extremely uncomfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable. Because we do not get to choose what, uh, what, what the terrain of battle can be. Uh, the left is often, uh, we live in an ideological fantasy land that thinks because we understand uh, how the system works, how capitalism works, that we can somehow use our own preferences to decide on what terrain to fight and who our allies are going to be. But if we're going to defeat the drive toward right-wing authoritarianism, Christian supremacy, racism, that's represented by the MAGA bloc, we're going to be in some very uncomfortable alliances. And we are going to have to fight on the messy terrain of US electoral politics, voting for a lot of people that we don't like. These are the harsh realities of what it's going to take to fulfill our political responsibilities at the moment. And only clarity on how important that strategic task is to make a breakthrough, to start our class and rallying all oppressed people in the direction of a better world and making the kind of change. Only clarity on that is going to equip us in order to move forward. I'm going to try to flesh that out a little bit by going back to the 1960s, saying something about the gains of those times, the mistakes that were made by the left, uh, and why uh, we've reached the moment we have. The central fact, uh, in my opinion, to look at the 1960s is the role of the black-led civil rights movement in being the driving force of all the progress of those decades. It was the black-led civil rights movement that broke the back of McCarthyism and re-legitimized protest in the United States. It was the black-led civil rights movement that broke the back of Jim Crow. A uh, hundred years of Jim Crow after 200 years of slavery. Uh, you know, there's a lot of contempt in the United States uh, left for, you know, we talk about bourgeois democracy and how terrible it is. The United States has only been a bourgeois democracy for 70 of the 430 years that it's existed as a political entity since 1619 in the United States. And what we call bourgeois democracy wasn't run by the bourgeoisie. It was run by the struggles of the working class, the black liberation movement, the women's movement to win the right to vote and to win something even close uh, to political democracy. Uh, the uh, black-led civil rights movement was also as a contingent of the global struggle against capitalism, Western domination, and white supremacy. Uh, the power punch behind the anti-Vietnam War movement, whether it was Martin Luther King and SNCC, the National Welfare Rights Organization, or the rebellion of black soldiers killing their officers in Vietnam that made the army in Vietnam absolutely useless to implement that racist and imperialist war. And the black-led civil rights movement opened the space for and inspired second wave feminism, the modern LGBTQ movement, and was the driving force in its late 60s form in, the in the creating the revolutionary uh, generation of 1968. Uh, my comrades and I believed in the late 1968, 69, 70, that our task, we had been through the dress rehearsal for the American Revolution. We were going to prepare an advanced vanguard in order to lead the revolutionary struggle for a more advanced move to the left that would be shortly down the road after some minor period of law. Uh, that's not how history worked out. We did a lot of great things, and uh, people can study the period of the 1970s and the grassroots fights that we engaged in in the early battles against what we called at the time the rise of Reaganism, and today is called neoliberalism. But we have to say we fundamentally misassessed the historical moment. We weren't able to adjust 
uh, when it became clear that we were not going to be in a new period of offensive, even larger, more radical, and likely more violent than the 1960s. Instead, we were heading for a long defensive period against the counter-revolutionary assault of Reagan. And that isolated us from the very constituencies that we had tried so hard to build a base within. And that kind of ultra-left thinking uh, marginalized us and meant that a tremendous amount of the revolutionary energy of the 1960s got dissipated over the 1970s. The folks who formed DSA in 1982 had a much more realistic perception, came around to that perception much quicker than we did. Uh, that those strands about what kind of historical moment we were in. Uh, they built a big tense organization. They built an organization that was accessible, and they positioned themselves in the right place in American politics at the time which was as part of the broadest front against Reaganism, trying to build a socialist ginger group presence within a broad progressive trend. And that's the reason that those kinds of things became a container for the, uh, uh, that, that was aligned essentially with Bernie Sanders politics uh, in 2016-2017. The unfortunate thing is they made a terrible mistake of standing aside from the Rainbow Coalition and the Jesse Jackson movement, which was the black-led movement that became the center of gravity for the resistance in the 1980s. And that meant that instead of a meshing together of the revolutionary currents out of the 1960s and a more realistic left current that formed the USA, we left this generation with the mess that we left you all, for which I apologize. Um, but that was the way history worked out. And there's something to learn from our mistakes. This generation can make new mistakes. Thanks. <laughs>
uh, and uh, a substantial socialist feminist uh, presence as uh, well, uh, a very strong commitment with anti-imperialist uh, politics and most certainly a commitment to ground itself uh, in the multiracial uh, working class. Uh, so uh, when I uh, later was uh, separated from the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, another word for expulsion, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, my comrades uh, in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, and mind you, this is a, a, a political party based in the homeland, not here in the diaspora, and I was already at the tender age of 23 a member of its national uh, central committee uh, based in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and uh, our leadership included uh, a lot of trade unionists uh, that played important roles uh, in the struggle, uh, leaders in the mass movement, the resistance uh, uh, there in the homeland and here in the diaspora, uh, uh, in places like uh, you know Chicago, where I spent uh, a, a lot of uh, time uh, building you know the party because uh, my main task as the organizational secretary was in fact you know uh, that of building you know the party. Uh, so uh, uh, after being separated. Uh, from the PSP for being a social democrat reformist. Mm -hmm. uh, although I recall, you know, we were a Marxist Leninist party and I was, you know, one of the people that screamed the, loud, the loudest about the necessity of uh, putting more emphasis on Marxism Leninism uh, and not so much emphasis on revolutionary nationalism, mm -hmm. which was in fact the main character of our organization. And uh, for you know, to have, uh, a, you know, the party uh, become part of a broader uh, left uh, movement uh, of building uh, uh, this, you know, movement that uh, uh, Max and other comrades were engaging, this uh, uh, multiracial, multinational uh, new uh, communist movement. Uh, the fact is that for some reason that uh, uh, helped me uh, to find my path into a, a social democratic reformist organization called the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee. Uh, and I joined in the uh, late uh, 1960s uh, and immediately started to spend a lot of time uh, building the uh, uh, so-called minority commissions or the people of color commissions. Uh, which were devoting a lot of time to figure out how to uh, uh, recruit, you know, comrades uh, of color uh, into uh, DSOC at the time. So that gave me the opportunity to work very closely with comrade Manny Maraba and other uh, comrades uh, in uh, figuring out this question that we're still grappling with, which is uh, how do we transform uh, what continues to be a majority white organization into a multiracial organization rooted in the multiracial working class. So the, the, this SOC and later, you know, uh, when the two organizations uh, merged into what became uh, BSA, uh, uh, is uh, radically different <laughs> from what I witnessed uh, in those days radically different. In fact, my theory is that DSA has been refounded. Mm. Uh, uh, Justin, if you can hand me the water there, because for some reason, when I start thinking about this refounding, I, my throat <laughs> becomes a little dry. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by refounding is that DSA uh, up to you know the 1980s, and David uh, you know played a pivotal role in that transition. Hopefully, he'll be able to speak about uh, what those changes were. But before I uh, went to organize workers in different parts of this country, across borders in Mexico and Central America and the Caribbean and my own homeland uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, DSA was this. Uh, you know, social democratic uh, reformist organization led by Michael Harrington, uh, you know, 
and the, the line was pretty much set by uh, uh, by uh, uh, Michael Harrington uh, and uh, many of the people, many of the comrades around him, which included a number of comrades that actually had come out of the Socialist Party. That uh, you know, factional fight that resulted in the creation of DSOC, and then the other faction, the State Department Socialists, uh, that became known as the Social Democrats USA, uh, that following the tradition of Jay Lobston and Max uh, Chapman uh, and other people whose names probably don't mean a lot to a lot of you, uh, but uh, we have to study this history because we are part of the continuum of the left in this country. One of the challenges that I uh, feel uh, uh, we have uh, is the, 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 the desire not to embrace you know, the traditions of the left that we are very much a part of. You know, uh, the socialist left, the communist uh, left, uh, and why not saying, uh, why not saying the Trotskyist uh, left. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when I came back into uh, active uh, life uh, in DSA after serving as a national Soviet for uh, the Sanders campaign uh, in 2020, spending a lot of time in uh, Nevada making sure that we organized the hospitality workers and so that we beat the shit out of uh, you know the Biden uh, you know forces in the Caucasus uh, there and that was uh, one of the highlights of uh, the return to uh, 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 I some comrades uh, who are in this room managed to conspire to persuade me to run for a delegate in the 2021 convention. Uh, and uh, later did I know that what they had in mind was actually to persuade me to run for the national leadership of DSA again at my tender age. <laughs> uh, after you know, many, many decades uh, of organizing on the left and in the working class uh, movement, now I find myself spending time in rooms with comrades half my age and one third my age. And you can imagine you know, the challenge that poses uh, those of you from our generation because I believe besides all of the challenges that we face as, as a political organization, the question of the ages and the generations uh, unfortunately continues to be one of them. Uh, so uh, now we have a DSA uh, being a multi-tendency organization, but a multi-tendency organization of the kind that I would have never dreamed in my wildest dreams, right? We have libertarian socialists, right? Uh, we have uh, many comrades that, that call uh, themselves uh, scientific socialists, uh, such as myself, or Marxists. Uh, we have uh, comrades uh, who are Trotskyists. <laughs> in different incarnations of uh, Trotskyism, uh, from the IS uh, to the ISO to the, I don't know, bread and roses, uh, and, uh, the different uh, influences, uh, you know. Uh, and I dare suggest that the uh, most influential ideological uh, tendency, I, I don't use the word hegemonic, uh, is in fact Trotskyism. Uh, in DSA, that explains uh, a lot about the direction <laughs> that the organization has taken. And then as a reaction to that, uh, some uh, caucuses that are called themselves communists, uh, uh, as a reaction pretty much to the presence of Trotskyists uh, within the organization. Uh, and they're not the kind of communists that I met in the Communist Party USA back uh, in the uh, early 1970s or late 1960s, a different kind of, uh, sometimes I wonder if they would describe themselves as Stalinist or not uh, in reaction to the presence of Trotskyism, but that could probably be the subject of another discussion. <laughs> uh, the fact is that uh, we are a very diverse uh, multi-tendency organization and that explains a lot of these challenges. I have one minute uh, to wrap uh, this up. So I'm going to make uh, the, uh, my pitch, which is uh, DSA uh, must not remain silent in the face of the rise of authoritarianism and fascism. We have got to become very much engaged uh, in this fight 
uh, we have got to develop our own critique of uh, uh, the fall of uh, liberal democracy. And my take on it would be that we have to put the working class, the multiracial working class, front and center of democracy and the fight for democracy. Democracy doesn't mean a fucking thing if the working class is not front and center uh, of this fight for democracy. And that's going to be difficult because one of the challenges that we face is do we build alliances with liberals and with Democrats, right? Uh, which reminds me that we're still very much uh, caught up in the whole debate, the perennial debate about reform and revolution. Uh, we haven't figured it out, just like many other generations figure it out. And finally, we have to fight to not only protect, but expand fundamental democratic and social rights that working people throughout history have been fighting for. That has got to be one of the most important tasks of DSA moving right into the midterms and beyond into our convention and next year. And I'll leave it there and uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Thank you so much, Mark. Can the folks hear me okay? okay. So hi, thanks again uh, for coming on this morning. <laughs> uh, it's always a really appreciate, I know the last day conference, I've planned many of these. So it's much solidarity, especially on a holiday for folks here. So I'm going to focus my remarks a little bit more on how it, the history can influence today in terms of how DSA picks programs. So I think what I'm going to, what I want you to leave with today is thinking about like how does DSA, how can we have a strategy as programmatically that's influenced by our politics and how it be effective versus just doing things because they're the right things to do. Or just doing strict, or having a strategy that's like mimicking other organizations. Um, and so I joined DSA about 20 years after the founding, uh, as Justin mentioned, as a college student. Um, and so to put some things into perspective about size, it was really, I would, it's probably without the debate, it was DSA's lowest point. So it's like you have, uh, before when I became the staff for the youth section, uh, it was, I found out we had four chapters. So, I mean, there are probably cities with more YDSA chapters now than the whole national organization had. We had probably five or 6,000 members maybe on paper. What we relied heavily on at that time, which we don't do anymore today for, for neither good or bad reasons, but we would, DSA would send out what's called direct mail, where you would just or rent a, a list of like, let's say the nation subscriber or Jack Ben subscribers, you would ask them to join. And this was how DSA stopped from going broke. It was like literally just recruiting people who were never going to be activists, but were the financial um, backing of the organization. And so when I realized I inherited um, kind of staff, like this really bad situation, I said, like, I have to have strategy as the sole staffer, because this time it's also two and a half staff nationally, like not two YDSA staffers. Like they have on there, it's like two and a half staff nationally. How can I use my time most effectively? And so one, I was encouraged, for example, by the, the MPC at the time. They were like, table, because I was based in New York, table Columbia, table NYU. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I said that, because I knew coming from, I come from a small chapter that had uh, been actually in a socialist group, a Democratic Socialist Club, but then affiliated with YDSA. It was like, you, have, you should focus on strategically chapters where you know, areas where there isn't really actually a big left. Because there's, if I had tried to go to NYU or Columbia with this very, like, more fun DSA pitch, it just wouldn't, New York City is such a vibrant city in terms of left-wing politics, it just wouldn't be a sell. So I focused on two things. I focused on communities and schools where there weren't strong lefts, like the school I had come from. And then I'd also, apropos what I'd done for my school, like, looked for uh, on Facebook at the time, and it was, it was Twitter was, didn't really exist. I would just go through, me and some of the volunteers would just comb uh, uh, campus groups and find like socialist clubs that didn't have an affiliation. So for example, a lot of folks, uh, people active in Chicago um, came out of this chapter called Worcester, which was the ice cream socialist that she got to affiliate. And I'm telling you the story because I think it speaks to like, 
uh, you could do the obvious easy thing. You can like just table where, where it's familiar, where it's safe, or you could try to do both. But so I just had to pick, I was one human being with limited time, and I just picked, that was my strategy. And it worked. It doesn't necessarily, and also sometimes I think with some humility, it doesn't probably work just because I had like one thing to do. And, and other things could work too, but it's like you don't want to be everything to everyone. Um, and then so we were able to grow YDS to 12 chapters, which was pretty big at the time. Uh, in, and we pretty much, and then I'll go into the, to the Bernie era, like kind of plateaued around 20. Um, and I've done some history research. And I think that was probably what was possible with the political moment until Bernie. And when I became staff two was uh, around 2000, was that actually not around, was 2006. And for those who may not remember, that was the year Bernie Sanders ran for Senate for the first time. And so DSA, what it did, which I thought was also strategically wise, was DSA didn't have a lot going on programmatically, but what it could do, especially before campaign finance laws changed a little bit, was it could organize lots of fundraisers for Bernie across the country. And what it did was we um, were able to uh, fundraise about 1% of his, uh, of his uh, campaign funds that, or that cycle. Um, he was very appreciative. Um, he came and spoke at our convention, and, and then he did something else, which I'm going to rig up in a sec. But um, and that was, we were able to like finally get some good activity. But then, so that was one thing where you can have a good program, but not really a good strategy of like, well, then what do you do with all these folks who've gotten engaged? There's nothing really left to do. So DSA went through what I would call from like 2007 to, to about 2010, like this really just like repetitive stage where we, where we had hoped based on previous success um, to like create programming that maybe other organizations would take off. So what's actually not really known is that if, if there's a group called the United Students Against Sweatshops, which is a campus group. Some of that came out actually out of what, the, what is now YDSA doing Michaela and Adora um, exchanges. And then, then the labor movement took that great idea and did something, which was fine for DSA. It was like, DSA didn't have the capacity to host this, but it was an idea. So one idea was like, we, we did an economic justice agenda, where we drafted this whole document that we hope uh, will become kind of a uniting doc, a force around uh, the progressive liberal left, especially there were these social forum meetings going on where thousands of activists would join. Um, we did a renegotiate NAFTA campaign, which Bernie, which one of the things Bernie did was he like said this is a good idea. We were hoping the labor movement would take that. And then a few years later, we did the Social and Economic Bill of Rights. And I'll never forget my father asking me, because he's a paper member, so he's actually a good vantage point to what people are thinking. He's like, didn't you already do this with the economic justice agenda? And I had nothing, was kind of like dumbfounded, because he was right. It was just really the same thing repackaged that didn't really, um, offer anything new, and so we were kind of in this rut where we couldn't really break free. And what we were able to do, though, slowly and surely, which Natalie will speak to a little bit as well, is like, one was keep, one was keep the youth section alive, which we think what did really matter in terms of keeping at least a group of younger and newer cadre involved in the organization, who then also was very critical when the burn and Trump bombs happened, have people who then come back, who have been like, have the training, don't have to learn it again, but maybe have been inactive. We also had and made an effort to, you know, change our website, change, um, pardon me, change, like get on more social media where, where we could be more open and more new so when this moment came, we were ready for it. And I think the last thing I would say, which kind of differentiated us between um, our peers at the time, which kind of were like the progressive Democrats of America, um, which is uh, just kind of like doing the inside-outside strategy and like the Committees for Correspondence and Democracy Socialism, which is kind of XCP people, similar, all like kind of, we had all very similar domestic politics, different international politics, uh, was it, was that we had the, we were able to jump in when Bernie was getting elected, was getting, was um, going to run. And I think that was the kind of the key thing was we had built slowly and surely an infrastructure to be ready for the moment to arrive. And Natalie will talk more about the programming we did, so I'm trying to avoid that. But we had a stage where we had, unlike other social organizations, we had like, for better or for worse, but in this case for better, uh, a very easy entry level, like you could just sign up and join. We had like 
very clearly endorsed Bernie Sanders and wanted people to support him. So while other groups like PDA had done that, I mean, of course, lots had it. What we had over PDA was we had the branding. Bernie never called himself a progressive Democrat. He barely called him. only runs in the Democratic primaries. is not identified with that. So we were able to, through like building infrastructure and taking advantage, we're able to use this moment really to grow. And I think that's what um, I was really proud of. And I think that when we took people in too, we were able to give people things to do and people were able to jump in. And I think that's why, I mean, Justin, you were one of the people who joined up for Trump, right? Yeah, and then people could find a way to democratically join. And that's when the organization became much more dynamic and we'll probably the questions and the answers we'll talk. Well, then more, but I think so. One thing I want to focus on a little bit too, going back to the strategy, is also about like what what's working, what isn't working now today too reflects the past strategy. So I brought kind of this hat <laughs> I got, which you might think is a DSA hat, but is from actually the a Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian Democratic Party of Labor, which was our um, at the time was an associate international with us and. Social International is like is this global federation that comes from historically <coughs> socialist and social labor parties uh, has gone through a lot of changes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but I think the internationalism aspect reflects both how you can be strategic and non-strategic in programming. Where we we had such pride in being the Social International in this incredibly esoteric way <laughs> that I think Jose would remember where we had these fights with the Social Democrats USA that he mentioned, who were also members. And most people probably had no idea what this was. And we would go to these meetings, feel self-important, you'd go abroad, you would be with these, these important, left, what it would seem like important leaders at the time. Um, and it wasn't, but in the end, nothing really materially came out of that. And I think that what's been fascinating to see about what has improved for the better um, in DSA's international politics is like, how do you connect the domestic strategy to the global solidarity? And so gallivanting to meetings is not doing that. Neither is kind of putting statements out or taking positions or there's no programming connected to. So I won't, so I'll focus on the positive and I think about what came out of the meeting yesterday when we were discussing the Pink Tide and someone from the audience was uh, biased here in this case, but someone in the audience was like, you know what was great was when you know, we did that Starbucks exchange with the Chilean workers and the U.S. and the, and the and he didn't say this, but I'm saying he was like there was the workers from Australia and the U.S. workers. And what was clear is like we voted in 2019 to have an orientation towards mass parties, and then that gave people like me and Jana, who have gone on and Ashik, who have gone on delegations, like much clearer guidance. If you want to meet with these mass parties. And we have labor priorities like Starbucks um, and other union organizing. So it's much clearer for us, for me, to be like, we should do this exchange because it fits. Because it fits exactly. Whereas having just kind of broad statements where we don't actually then give clear guidance to the membership and to the leaders about how to actually implement programming hurts. So I just want to really leave you all with like these historic examples of how I think you have to make strategic, where DSA's most succeeded is when we do strategic programming guided by our principles, not just doing things because they're the right thing to do without a clear path, nor just doing, just having programming for the sake of programming, which the last example would be like the economic justice agenda, the social economic bill of rights, which are wonderful statements that no one will ever read again. <laughs> so I'm really, in fact, really excited to hear about that and what Natalie's going to do next, so I'm going to take a, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> and then I drink a lot of water and then I have to run to the bathroom. But thank you all for bearing with me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about myself, which is that I'm extremely nosy. <laughs> um, if you have or are currently or have ever been a DSA member, could you just raise your hand? Okay, thanks. I'm with my people. <laughs> um, does anybody here know what you get in the mail when you join DSA? 
Yeah. A card and Democratic left. What does the card say? Socialist organizer. It says socialist organizer. It says your name and it says you are an official socialist organizer. And I want to start with that because when I got my card in the mail, which sadly I no longer have because somebody stole the wallet that I had with it in it. Um, Michael, if you could hook me up with a card in the future, please send mine my way. Um, I felt like the best that I've ever felt in my life when I got that card in the mail. I felt like I'd arrived. And, um, you know, I think when we talk about DSA, obviously, um, there are times when we've lived up more to the socialist part than the organizer part and vice versa. But I think to me, um, that enduring mission of creating socialist organizers in the United States is DSA's purpose and it's what I really want to ground my talk in. Um, I joined DSA uh, very much in the low period that David described. I don't, I don't want to rehash the things that he said, but it was midway through the Obama administration. And um, I think there was a little bump in the organization because the right was invoking so much fear mongering about socialism. So I, I don't know if anybody else in here joined around that time, but I definitely was like, well, what is a socialist really? Oh, it's me, it's not Obama. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of, you know, that's the short story of how I joined. Um, but I do, you know, to kind of add a little bit to what um, David has already said, um, I can't stress enough how, and this is my perspective, but how in those early days, you know, it was around 2012, I really felt like I stepped into an organization where, where people had experienced a lot of trauma, like a lot of deep trauma from the splits on the left. And that, you know, there is something so unique and special about DSA being an organization on the left formed through a merger and not a split. And I think that that is because of the tenacity um, of, a, of a generation of people who built the organization. But at the same time, I definitely stepped into a culture that was um, not in a healthy place in terms of having political debates of consequence. Um, and I think that both comes from our history. It comes from the attacks on the left and the fact that it was not easy, you know, in, in the early 2000s to be doing out socialist politics of consequence. But, you know, if we're being honest about the challenges of that moment, um, you know, having a political debate and walking out with a document or a commitment that didn't include two uh, drastically opposed ideals was hard. Um, and so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how, how did we break out of that? Because it didn't just happen by getting a whole new generation of thousands of people who were new to socialist politics in the organization. It, it happened intentionally, right? Um, and so I'll start by talking a little bit about just what we did in my chapter in those years. Um, when I joined, we had one campaign. It was an abolished student debt campaign. I believe that was passed nationally in YDSA around 2012 or 2013. And the good part was it was a campaign. It had goals. It, you know, we were we were trying to grow DSA and recruit younger people to the organization through that cam, but campaign. But also, it lacked a lot of the things that you should see in a campaign plan. It had no escalation of like how we were going to reach, you know, you know, abolition of debt. Um, it didn't really have a clear plan for how we were going to reach the people that mattered. Um, I, for one, joined DSA after I graduated from college because there were no campus organizations on the left at my at my campus, um, and I cared a lot about student debt, right? Because I was paying down my loans. But it turns out when you go and you have a petition and you're trying to reach students on a college campus, they're not paying their debt yet. That's not their most pressing issue. Um, and it becomes really, really difficult to organize them into your group. And that's kind of like the theme for me of what DSA was like from 2012 to 2015. We had really big activist ideals. We wanted to have campaigns where we could win, where we could agitate people, where we could share class politics. Um, but it's really, really difficult to do that and to recruit people to the socialist left when there's no victory in sight. 
So I actually think, even though I'm the biggest proponent in the world of you're a socialist if you spend the majority of your time talking to working class people who aren't already socialists, uh, it, it, that being said, I think actually like some of the most important things that we did in that period um, were rooted much more in internal strategy discussion and rooted in political education more so than like our, our activist project. So I'm going to turn and talk about two things that I think were really, really important during those years and in, in turning the tide and like emboldening DSA to have discussions of consequence and like commit to one option versus another totally distinct option. Um, one was, I think David touched on this, but um, when I joined, there was an ongoing national strategy discussion with the goal of, of walking away with like a, a somewhat evergreen for 10 years strategy document that would guide our work across the organization. And um, this was also the time where Jacobin was popping off and those of us who were younger and joining the organization and, and finding the internal culture, you know, to be honest, somewhat stifling sometimes, we really used the Jacobin reading groups as like a close space to bring people into the organization who weren't necessarily like quite ready to join and to have the kind of political discussions that we felt like we needed to have. Um, so I want to talk about some of the two biggest shifts that I think happened through those spaces and, and also definitely increasingly as time went on through DSA directly and through our national strategy discussion. Um, one is around labor. Um, so I think David and I probably represent the last generation in DSA that was um, encouraged and, and supported directly to take union staff jobs. Um, <clears throat> Joe Schwartz, who you know was like a, a, a long distance runner in DSA, is a long distance runner in DSA, and who really mentored me for years, helped me get um, my first organizing job on the Fight for 15 campaign. And it was great, like, we, we can have a whole sidebar conversation about how complicated the Fight for 15 campaign was, but I would say just like, to tell you, you know, like, I'm like a young 22 year old socialist, I think I'm gonna make the revolution happen in the next 10 years of my life. And then I step into this campaign where workers have no control, they're getting fired left and right, and the, you know, our, our higher ups at the union are like unclear on the daily, on the daily, right, about what we're doing the next day. Um, I was definitely, um, my eyes were opened, right? And um, I felt really, really dejected about um, the capacity of the labor movement to, to usher in the political change that we need in this country. Um, so I went searching, and this is around a time, um, it's not quite yet Bernie happening yet, but um, Jacobin reading groups are happening. Um, a group of us, uh, younger folks in DSA, formed a left caucus where we were specifically trying to push more debates of consequence in the organization. Um, we teamed up with, there were um, members of another socialist organization called Solidarity, um, you know, who were joining the conversation, starting to join DSA around that time. And they were sharing things with folks like me, um, like Kim Moody's rank and file strategy pamphlet. And so we, we started to come into counter with more ideas, right? And um, uh, many of us took um, union like rank and file jobs. Um, I did, had a whole terrible experience doing that for other reasons. It turns out you need like a lot of support to be a rank and filer who makes your, your union functional. We can talk about that more later. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, it, that I think is one of the biggest shifts that I've seen in the last 10 years is that change away from the, the sort of the Harrington push to get people into the union staff jobs. And now, I think in 2019 at the National Convention, we officially passed a rank and file strategy, recognizing not just that like everybody should go out and get a union job, which obviously isn't possible, but right that part of our tasks as the socialist movement is rebuilding a militant left-wing union movement from the ground up. Um, one of the other conversations that I think really has changed DSA, and I, I promise I'll wrap up in one minute, um, excuse me, uh, was around electoral politics. Um, I would say that even before Bernie, a lot happened. I mean, a lot happened just because the Bernie campaign happened and DSA grew so much and we were able to be socialists in public. Um, and I think that had a degree of settling debates, but 
around, um, I want to say, 2015 in, in my city, there was um, a, a really solid progressive Democratic candidate for city council. Her name's Helen Ginn, who, you know, came out of um, an education movement and uh, was part of a coalition that really fought charterization in our city. And so she was a very good candidate in general and, and definitely a, a friend to um, the left. We had big internal discussions in my chapter. I'm sure other chapters were having discussions about whether or not to go all in on her campaign, whether it made sense for us as a socialist organization to do that. This is around the same time that Seth Ackerman's piece of um, a blueprint for a new party was happening, and we're all reading this in Jacobin reading groups and discussing. And then the Sanders campaign happened. And um, ultimately, my chapter decided to not endorse that campaign um, because we did believe that socialists need to have an independent political apparatus where they're consolidating their resources and, and have the ability to um, grow for those campaigns. Um, but I, I don't think that it was just the Bernie campaign. I think it was many other campaigns like Carlos Rosa here in Chicago, like Julia Salazar in New York, um, some of the campaigns for State House in Pennsylvania, where testing actually happened um, at the same time that we were having these strategy discussions that kind of resolved some of those political tensions. Um, so I will try and wrap up um, and just say that, you know, I think um, one of the things that I really agree with Max that he started out with is that. You know, the, the left in the U.S. really needs a political organization that can have debates of consequence and that can commit to a strategy, execute it, and reflect on whether or not it worked and for what reasons. And I think um, DSA has not always been that organization and maybe still sometimes struggles to do that. But I think with every year, that's the goal to me. Um, is to come together and be able to try things. I think, you know, in the last 10 years, I've tried a lot of things, some of them successful, some of them not. Um, but if we don't have that collective vehicle to reflect and have those discussions and have those experiments, we're screwed. Thank you, guys. about me, you know, I grew up as like one of those angsty communists that never thought I would vote in an election. Then through DSA, I successfully led the city council campaign here in Chicago, and very proudly served as a social security chef for two years. <laughs> so, anyways, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, I've been in the internal fights, I've had my crisis of faith, but I still have my card. So, my point is maybe to you, Max, um, trying to have a scientific understanding comparatively of this resurgent left and the new left period. I think one of the differences I don't know if you would agree, is that in that period, the US empire was in an ascendant position, just ready to globalize in a way that nobody would ever thought. And I don't know if you would agree with me, but I think in this context, I think we're seeing the US empire in a state of objective decline. I think it's possibly on the back foot. You saw what happened on January 6th, again, as the exit communist, I was like, I wish that was us. But um, it may not be a revolution, I guess, of our own choosing. So do you think that even if the setting pieces on the left may be similar to that period, 
but the context may actually be different, and it may actually be time to have more of an embrace of revolutionary politic because of the time in which we live in. Question number one, sorry, really quick, question number two. <laughs> right, we've been losing members, right? We're in this kind of like period of doubt. Uh, so in those periods, people tend to retreat back to their corners or whatever, and we've had an embracing of liberals, I think, a little more, and I, I do that too, it's natural for us to do. But understanding that the fascism is on the rise, I mean, historically understanding it is the liberals who open the door for these people. So I guess this is maybe another appeal for like, maybe instead of going the direction of continuing on the social democratic path, trying to find ways we can corral masses around more revolutionary politics. Very, very last thing. Um, <laughs> uh, you have three a, seconds. Uh, okay, uh, your, your mass org out there or the mass org at home, we came from a merger. Maybe instead of that, instead of the right coalition, maybe it's the right merger. Maybe instead of coalition, it's the right combination. Just a last thought. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, good morning, comrades. I'm George Merriman. I'm a member of the uh, New York City chapter, uh, South Brooklyn branch. And I've been around DSA since 2015 uh, via the Bernie campaign. And one thing I've noticed ever since I've been a member of DSA is that out there in South Brooklyn, I feel very disconnected from DSA as a national organization. I mean, we do a lot of work, a lot of good work on parochial uh, electoral things and, and local campaigns and everything. But then I come to things like this, you know, conferences and I was going to the People's Summit things and everything and hear all this stuff and I think, wow, this DSA organization seems like a really good thing. You know, why don't I hear more about them? That's my comment. Thank you, George. I'd like to speak to um, George's comments because um, this is like the thing that's perennially plagued me for the last 10 years of my life and I don't think it's easy right there are NPC member like current NPC members in, in the room who can um, speak to how difficult this is but you know I think I think as long as I've been in DSA there have been currents that come from specific political traditions that put more of an emphasis on hyper local politics and there are other currents that come from different traditions that maybe are more nationally oriented um, I come from a tradition that's more nationally oriented and people like to at me right like there was a time when um, I was part of a caucus that was like DSA should all get together and convene three years in advance and march on Washington for Medicare for all I died on that hill didn't win but right I, I think <laughs> I think that, um, you know, it's really, really hard to bridge those two connections and also in an organization with limited capacity. But I can speak to you right now on some of the things that I think would help some of the things that I've advocated for over time. I think some of the best local work that DSA does is its electoral work. And I, I'm, I've always been thinking about how do we bridge back, right, that local school board race that you know, city council race. How do we make that connection really clear um, between that candidate running as a DSA candidate locally and nationally? And I think some of what we need to do, right? We need like a better like political platform as an organization, so that we know and can succinctly communicate to whatever person's door we're knocking on. These are the top ten things that DSA stands for. And this is what they might look like locally, but this is what they look like all across our country. That's really hard, but I think if we're going to be more effective as an organization, we need to get there, and we need to get there like two years ago. I'll, I'll respond both, but uh, mostly to Diego, I think, because it was a good question. Um, I think one thing I always tell people, which speaks to strategy too, is like, we can't I can't think of DSA so unique that it's like not influenced by external factors such as like American culture. <laughs> um, so I think we'll take, so, so that and I'll talk to George is like, well, yes. One of the things that socialism is going against a very ingrained American culture of like localism, of like yeah. don't tell me what to do, which we isn't is really part of our society. I mean people don't I mean that's why 
Um, it's, it's a founding values of, um, and so it's very, we, you see those internal fights mimicked um, in DSA, and I think so it makes it hard sometimes also to build a national core, because we have to also change how people have been trained to think their whole lives about national centers. Um, and I think that it's important to also, what I do see and I don't like is when people say like, when I try to sometimes like draw comparisons, like, well, DSA is actually doing relatively good compared to like, let's say, these other liberal left civic society organizations. People are like, well, why should we compare ourselves to them? We're better. I'm like, well, you have to have a metric in order to compare like how civic engagement is going. And I think DSA membership actually, you know, isn't. It's gone back to pretty much where it's high point. Um, and I think so. That's an important thing where I feel like there's this narrative out there that like we're hemorrhaging members that actually is not backed by the data and certainly not backed by if you compare to other. Uh, small D democratic groups on the progressive left um, or who, who are more hemorrhaging members. So it's like, what are we, so it's actually like, well, what are we doing right and they're not doing it? I, I don't have necessarily an answer, but I think that's important to think about too. And I think one, my also, where, where I've written about this in these times, some probably like a handful of you have read, where I think like we can say liberals do in naval fascism, that's true, but DSA and other socialists aren't actually doing as much as we could. Uh, to kind of deal with like things such as January 6th, where Cory Bush does have legislation that would push further than liberals want to go about punishing Republicans, and DSA hasn't actually officially supported that either. So it's like, so it's kind of like this cop out where it's like we're like they're too soft on fascism, but then actually, kind of the people who are, who are hysteronic about Trump have kind of really been vindicated about how bad and dangerous he really was. So I think that it's like we also have to step up in ways that can push liberals to be better on authoritarianism. Um, and I think that that's kind of why I think both sides are kind of not stepping up to the plate in certain ways. Uh, well, organizations operate on many different levels. And I think the level that um, David and Natalie spoke about is absolutely crucial in terms of the practical decisions that the DSA needs to make in terms of implementing whatever strategies it agrees upon. But uh, <clears throat> I want to speak to Diego's point since you asked me directly. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's correct that in the late 60s and 70s, the US was not in decline. Its hegemony was not in decline in the way it is today. But we didn't understand that at the time. And we were not the only ones. A monthly Review ran a major piece, The End of U.S. Hegemony, uh, The Global Balance of Forces at the time. It was common, far beyond the revolutionary left, to think that U.S. Hegemony, the defeat in Vietnam and the breaking of Jim Crow and the explosions at home, the near revolution in France in 1968, meant that Western imperialism was in decline. And the global revolutionary movement for socialist camp, those countries that had broken with capitalism were on the rise. So we were wrong, but that was the dominant opinion at the time, and it led us to do what we did. Um, as far as today, empires in decline do not tend to give rise to revolutionary movements. Empires in decline tend to give rise to reactionary movements to retain their lost glory. And that's what we see in the US today. This is the main factor that we see. The rise of socialism in terms of opinion is fantastic. But in terms of institutional infrastructure and mass organization, <clears throat> the white evangelical churches have replaced the labor movement and the black church as the predominant mass organizations in the US today. And they're under right wing control. The most dangerous thing in the world is people who have guns and who've been ruling the world who think they are the victims. And that's the mentality that has been built up behind the MAGA block. 20, this country was structured, it, ta it taps in to a structure that says normal in this country is white. Normal in this country is white. Normal in this country is a certain set of racial and gender hierarchies. This is the merger of white nationalism and Christian supremacy. And there are millions of people in this country. We, as revolutionaries, believe 
that equality, the movements of specially oppressed groups are the driving force toward class unity and toward rallying everyone toward a better world. But that's not the experience and the mentality of huge sections of this country fed by right-wing billionaires. It says any gain for African Americans in particular or for immigrants is a loss for white people. And the mentality right now that we are facing, you know, uh, everyone here I'm sure supports Palestinian rights. We have to learn something from the mentality of Israeli Jews, which is they are running that country and look at the way that that has evolved because they think they're the victims. They have the victim mentality, and that's what we're facing in MAGA today. Where I agree with you, Diego, is I think if MAGA is defeated, the rapidity of a pace toward radical solutions could be much faster than previous times and can be driven because the level of crisis, of climate crisis, the crisis of inequality is so severe that if we can turn back the fascist tide, there are possibilities for a very bright future and for the left to grow. But we will not grow if we have not built the infrastructure. Bernie's campaigns and Bernie's losses show it's not ideas alone that win politics. You can have all kinds of sympathy from people's ideas. If you're not there on the ground, the way Natalie was talking about being an organizer in Food for 15. If you're not there on the ground, you're not, you don't have the credibility. If the left is not there on the ground as the most resolute fighters against the Trumpist racist time, we will not have the credibility to drive the next stage progressive forwards if we beat them. So to me, the thinking is upside down. It's not that we have to show how different we are from the Biden people and the liberals. It's that we have to show the working class and communities of color that we are standing the most resolute forces against fascism to have the credibility to play the leading role that we can play in the next round. And we, can, we are willing to get our hands dirty. We are willing to do things. It's not our purity that's more important than beating those people. an organization of uh, almost 100,000 members with 250 chapters across the entire United States, uh, which is perhaps uh, the only organization uh, uh, beyond the uh, Communist Party and the Socialist Party of their uh, heydays uh, that has reached uh, such a scale and size, and yet uh, you would think that uh, you know we they're practically uh, invisible in terms of the national you know debate about this question of the uh, challenge you know to democracy uh, that we're facing you know uh, and uh, I believe that uh, we have to uh, develop our own critique uh, of uh, you know democracy uh, that uh, is uh, grounded uh, on what's happening with the uh, multiracial uh, working class uh, in this country, the things that we discover as a result of uh, this pandemic, uh, you know, the inequities that, that became so clear uh, and so uh, uh, powerful. Uh, and uh, uh, I believe that uh, it's necessary in the context of this 40th anniversary to structure a debate in the organization uh, about uh, you know this question of uh, the necessity of building uh, a, uh, a broad alliance to fight you know the threat of uh, a rising authoritarianism and fascism uh, because uh, what I hear uh, often gives me the sense that some comrades really feel that we are the sum of the entire left. 
in DSA. Uh, and, uh, or that perhaps we are, in fact, you know, the left. Uh, you know, I believe that it's absolutely critical for uh, an organization that organizes a socialist openly and publicly because that creates space for everybody else that does not want to call himself or herself a socialist or a communist in a mass organization. I mean, that has its reasons, right? But the fact that we can operate, you know, publicly and that we can, you know, make the fight uh, for, you know, this vision of a, an alternative, uh, you know, political uh, reality and uh, an alternative uh, uh, economy that uh, allows and privileges, you know, workers uh, most of all, uh, I think it's, you know, something that, uh, you know, uh, requires us to be audacious uh, in this moment. And we are not being audacious uh, in the moment and bold. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, in the context of the 40th anniversary and preparing and setting the stage for uh, next year's convention, we have to structure this debate and it can, this cannot happen over Twitter, please, <laughs> you know, uh, or in these uh, dark, you know, chat rooms where people seem to have their three meals, meals a day, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, this has got to happen uh, openly, it has to be structured, we have to have positions, papers, you know, uh, naming and calling, you know, the different approaches, uh, but that is our responsibility and obligation as, uh, you know, as socialists. Comrades, I, I, I don't want to talk too much, but I just want to say I really appreciate everybody's comments. And one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently, I think, you know, in many ways since the Dobbs decision, but I think, you know, a lot of things have, have, have factored into that is the fact that, like, we have something to say about democracy that I think is unique. Um, most people, liberal, progressive, when they talk about democracy, they're talking very narrowly about. Congress, they're talking about the state, they're talking about voting for electeds, they're talking about the Supreme Court, maybe. Um, and those things are important, but I think what we have to offer is a much broader, deeper vision of what democracy means that extends beyond those buildings, beyond those places. Um, but we have to articulate that to people. Um, and I think that's one of the things we have to figure out in the next year as we approach the convention, like Jose is talking about, about how we're going to make that case to people. Uh, about how the left has something to offer in terms of democracy, a much broader vision of it. Uh, let's get two more people up. Uh, uh, comrade in the back in the Troublemakers Union shirt. Uh, comrade in the back in the maroon shirt. Um, uh, can you hear me all right? Hi, Tom. Hi. How's it going, Natalie? Uh, thank you, comrades, for this talk. Uh, I really appreciated it. Um, I think that uh, I wanted to make a comment, uh, you know, and ask for your perspective on uh, my, after explaining a little bit of my experience, for the last five years, my work has primarily been building uh, a brand new chapter. My work in DSA has been building a brand new chapter uh, in Milwaukee which didn't exist before 2016. Um, and, and I think as part of that, I've seen a, uh, a lot of new members, uh, members who are not very enfranchised uh, who in the organization, folks who aren't in this room or in these kinds of meetings, uh, talking about national DSA like they think it's the Democratic Party, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that that, speaks to the missing fabric between local chapters and the national organization, the missing chap uh, fabric often between chapters and each other, um, which makes it feel like the national leadership is this completely separate autonomous thing from the, and imposed upon the local organizing, right? Um, and I, I think that that speaks to some of where the online debates are coming from and where a lot of this alienation and vitriol comes from online. Uh, 
But I, I think that at the same time, one thing I do want to, it, it, it's given me a perspective on why people are advocating for the strategies that they're advocating for. One reason in Milwaukee is the state of the left outside of DSA is bleak, mm -hmm. very, very bleak, to the point that like trying to organize mass-led organizations is it, it often, it, you, we get hostile reactions from other groups because of the way that they have been structured as very staff, okay. So um, all of this is just to say that I, I think that in order to, we're, we're in a difficult position because although we do need to call out the far right, we also have to distinguish ourselves from the Democrats and from other organizations in order to have the credibility to actually do that work. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you all very much um, for all your years of dedication, the wealth of experience and, and knowledge. Uh, my name is Rami Khalil, I'm from Seattle DSA and also I'm a member of their former Revolution Caucus. And I, I just wanted to delve deeper, picking up where the last comrade asked about into this question of alliances. Like I really agree that we should have a very sober, realistic assessment of the threat of the authoritarian right um, and that we need to tackle that, that we, we need to be the, as you were saying, like the most resolute fighters against um, the Trumpian right. Um, but I also wanted to um, question like, and also comrades spoke about the need for alliances and uncomfortable alliances, which I'm, I'm cool with uncomfortable alliances, but I would ask about how much shouldn't Shouldn't DSA distinguish ourselves clearly from the Biden corporate establishment wing of the Democratic Party more than we have been? Like, like, um, like I think it's it's good how Bernie said when he was campaigning. He said he was against Trump. You know, he would he wasn't shy about putting forward a fighting alternative to Trump, which was hard. <laughs> when you're running for president, you want to win over workers who have illusions in Trump. But he said, I'm against Trump, and he explained why. And I think DSA can, is doing that and can, should keep doing that. But I think we need to go further. Like, like, um, like, uh, like, shouldn't our DSA members in Congress form a socialist caucus in Congress so that they're distinct from the Democratic Party? Um, when we run candidates, can we run as independents? Or if we run as Democrats, can we... Uh, make clear our intention to have a, a future break with the Democratic Party. Um, like, and when Joe Manchin throws a fit and wrecks everything that the left and DSA wants, shouldn't, um, shouldn't Bernie and DSA members of Congress call for mass protests in the streets to, to push forward Biden's agenda? Um, so, yeah, I'm cool with, with like, alliances um, to fight the right, but also let's make sure we're, shouldn't we make sure that we are a distinct socialist wing of the fight against the right and not like just blended in with Biden, which I think plays into the hands of Tucker Carlson and the right wing. If, if there isn't, if the, if the, if Tucker Carlson's the only anti-establishment force in the country and there's not a left alternative, then, then um, all the anti-establishment frustration in the country gets behind Tucker Carlson instead of the socialist left. So that's a question I'm curious what y'all think or anyone thinks. Thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, Milwaukee's my hometown. Uh, I was active there in the early 70s. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you sometime about uh, Milwaukee. So someone, let's connect. Um, and I, and uh, I think I know your brother. Uh, uh, I was at Hannah's wedding, so and we met there. Uh, to, to the other speaker. But let me say this: uh, Yes, we need to establish our independent identity, and uh, I think the way you do that in the electoral arena is a lot of what how the SA and other groups like the Working Families Party, the PDA, Justice Democrats have been doing which is you fight like hell. You primary every moderate Democrat where you have a chance to win. Uh, Brittany DeBarros on Staten Island. 
uh, taking on the, probably the weakest front of the anti-MAGA front, which is peace, solidarity, anti-war. This is the place where there is the least division within the U.S. ruling class. They're divided on all kinds of other things, but they all want to maintain U.S. hegemony. Mm -hmm. And Brittany came out of a, a Iraq vets against the war. She's an Iraq vet. Uh, she ran a hell of a campaign denouncing Max Rose inside and out about the pro-war and everything. She got the endorsement of all these different progressive groups, and she lost. And nobody in her district is confused about her independent politics. And she turned around and wrote her message and said, we're going to get screwed whichever candidate wins, but it's essential to keep the fascists out of power. So we're going to vote for, uh, I forget the person's Max name, Rose. Max Rose against uh, Molly Anard. That's the way you would establish your independent identity. And you show if you lose, you're going to fight the fascists. Uh, I think DSA should get behind those kind of candidates everywhere in the electoral arena. And there's plenty of other ways to establish our independence and our distinct program, including what Jose said, all the different public things, uh, what Natalie was talking about, uh, what David said. There's all kinds of ways. You exchange Starbucks workers. You do all kinds of things. We go talk to people right now in Yemen, in Palestine. We bring people speakers. I don't think I, we absolutely have to do that. But right now, for DSA, Speaking of someone whose main contacts in the left or in other parts of the left, DSA lost a lot of points by seeming to sit out the fight against Trump in 2020. And if DSA sits out the fight against uh, Republican control of the Senate and the House, the way they now control half the states and the Supreme Court, it's going to isolate the ESA from the constituencies that you want. We need you. We need the ESA to build food center. This does not easy. And there's all kinds of things, and we can disagree on this or that specific. That's, that's why I know. I'm like the guy who kept saying Carthage must be destroyed every goddamn time. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't defeat the mega block, every. Yeah. Everything else is down, is down the toilet. That is the immediate breakthrough, and we have to grab onto that, and then find a way to do that in a way that builds the strength of the left. Once that's done, I'm, I'm with you 1,000%. Every single thing we can do to fight the corporate liberals that we're aligned with against Trump, we have to do all those things. But if we don't do the one that the breakthrough that's needed to stop the 60 to roll back against what we want in the 60s. a lot of room for us to uh, develop a more cohesive or incoherent uh, approach to strategy that puts us in the middle of this discussion uh, when the working class is paying the most attention, which is in the upcoming you know, congressional elections. Uh, and I think that uh, it may be difficult uh, to organize uh, ourselves in a way that uh, uh, may uh, uh, result in uh, supporting, you know, some of the candidates like uh, Comrade Brittany says, who's Brittany is actually a member of uh, DSA, and the shame of the whole thing is like Brittany was not endorsed, you know, by uh, DSA, uh, which is something that uh, it's interesting because uh, one of the things that I discovered. Uh, in the episode uh, uh, with uh, Jamal Bowman, uh, who is a member of ours, is that we really do not have an institutional relationship with the four members of, of Congress. We do not. 
we, we do not even talk to them uh, uh, with the exception of uh, moments when comrade uh, Christian Hernandez runs into Rebecca Rodriguez and Ocasio Cortez at an airport and says, <laughs> you know, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> or when Ocasio Cortez says, uh, uh, La Luz, can you help me put together a meeting with all of the grassroots organizations fighting uh, in Puerto Rico? Uh, and, and, you know, and, and that's when I, I'm able to raise uh, uh, the possibility of having a conversation about what's going on here in the mainland, the so-called mainland. So uh, it just think of, uh, you know, how uh, much of an impact we could have if somehow we could align our four members of Congress to do what Justin is saying, to put forth our critique in terms of democracy, mm -hmm. and insist that the, you know, the working class has to be front and center in this whole debate. And of course, when we say the working class, we're talking about the multiracial working class, right? Elementary Dr. Watson, right? <laughs> there is no other you know, advanced capitalist country uh, in the world that has a multiracial working class that has been shaped and formed over generations, you know, uh, since uh, uh, the uh, uh, former uh, enslaved people walked off the plantations uh, in what uh, Du Bois called the general strike, you know. Uh, and so uh, this is absolutely essential for us to seize the moment. And it may not happen in the context, now that we raise it, of a uh, united front, as some of us call it. Uh, we may not have the possibility of doing that, but for DSA to remain silent, you know, totally silent about the rise of authoritarianism and fascism in this country, I mean, that's, for me, this act that's actually criminal, you know? And so we have got to, figure out a way, and of course it's our task as the national leaders uh, to engage the chapters in that kind of conversation. Don't you think, right? Don't you really think that we have to do that? We're, we're, we're running out of time, right? We are. And I want to get, uh, I want to get David and uh, Natalie's responses to those questions before we depart. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I, I agree with a lot of what Jose just said, and, um, I also think that like my personal spin on it, you know, I think there's a question of, I don't think that we have a clear idea, especially in the electoral realm, what a healthy relationship looks like on the day-to-day -day in between election cycles with our electeds. We haven't, accept, we have not as an organization set a baseline. And that is complicated by the fact that a lot of, especially at the national level, our electeds are not organic leaders of DSA. DSA needs to run an organic leader of DSA for Congress who can be on the ground organizing these people. It's not just gonna happen through like trying to schedule a weekly call with the NPC and with these folks, right? There has to be somebody there who has DSA's interests and the left's interests um, at the forefront of how they operate. So that's one thing. Um, the, to get at Comrade with Rami, Rami, to get at some of your questions, I think, too, there's this piece. I think there's a huge tension in DSA between being able to do politics where we can hold a line and we can, like, have discipline to stick to what we agreed to, I think is in tension with having a very big tent organization that like lets anybody who pays five dollars join and i i don't have i've been struggling with that tension for the last 10 years of my life i don't have a clear answer i think one of the pieces of that problem is i think it takes like three years of mistakes to become a really good socialist organizer and when we constantly grow by leaps and bounds of tens of thousands of people who haven't had those three years to get their feet under them we're always like strategically and politically outpaced, right, by our growth. I think the inkling of what we do is we have to remember that the DSA, you know, sometimes it feels like we're the left, but as Jose said, we are not the whole left. 
And I think as we grow, as we gain footholds in other organizations and other sites of power in our country, it's not necessarily just DSA's job to do everything, right? Like we have to be thinking really sadly about how we go out as socialist organizers. And there's some fights that we do with our union hat on, with our school board member hat on, right? Um, but it's not easy, right? We're, we're certainly not close to just like, you know, all having the same opinion about what to do about Jamal Bowman, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think, just to piggyback on what Natalie said to give a, just the DSA history um, too, is like, while we quali quantitatively have the most DSA members in Congress, there was a guy, Ron Dellums, who was a representative from Oakland, yeah. uh, was the DSA vice chair. You could go to the old Democratic labs and buy ads. Like, you know, it was someone who really clearly beyond identified with the project, it wasn't just paying dues. And I think there's, that's, and it's interesting, it's like, is quantity versus quality, what is the fine line? You know, it's there's not an easy answer, but there was a very, but it's also, just to say, there's historic examples of what Natalie's talking about, the times that we've been alive. Most even, you know, it's not even like going back that far. Um, I do challenge a little bit what I think I'm hearing in that, and I, as someone who lived in DC and had to subscribe to all these horrible and beltway newsletters, like it's very, the, the ruling class knows the difference between Biden and AOC, for, and they're forgetting the DSA. I mean, it's like they, it's like when I would see people like AOC and Nancy Pelosi are friends, it's like, <laughs> no one in DC thinks that. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like her. and I don't. So it's something I think we become so desired to distinguish ourselves when people actually do know the difference. I think it's actually there's a a consensus that no one views DSA and Biden and vice versa as part of the same project outside of probably some elements of the right wing. Um, and so, and I think, and I don't also know what that would achieve, keep furthering those divides because I think that what because everyone said it, so I'm trying to say something more, something unique. But I think so. Let's go to the Socialist Caucus. Like Rami's question: Why don't we have a Socialist Caucus in Congress? I, here would be my practical argument against that: is that I think it's a solution in search of a problem, in the sense that I think the actual problem is what they've identified is that we have no mechanism in which to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I think like building like an institution that like where we have like in New York with the Socialist elected in office. Is much more valuable in the short, in the immediate term. I'm not saying long term. It's a bad idea. The, the idea is fine in itself, but it's more about what our relationship with these electeds. And if they want to form a caucus, that's great. But caucuses in Congress are kind of, except for a handful, are kind of more symbolic and more. And there's importance in symbolism too. So that's why I'm saying it's not. Just, it's, a, it's a good idea in principle. But I think the most immediate problem is like, how do we actually have a relationship? with them, which can be solved with or without them having uh, a formal grouping. So it's just something to think about. All right, uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for, for, for attending this talk, this panel. I want to thank the panelists, Jose, Max, thank David, you, Natalie. <laughs>